Hi, I'm Don Leinbaugh, Vice President of the Stewartstown Area Historical Society and a Professor of Historic Preservation at the University of Maryland. A welcome to this celebration of the Society's 40th anniversary year, 1984 to 2024. So tonight I'd like to talk a little bit uh, about our collections, uh, tell you a little bit about uh, those, both objects, documents, and paper collections, special collections, a little bit about our library. Uh, talk about our program. Uh, we have uh, exhibits, both permanent exhibits and changing exhibits, special exhibits. Uh, we have a regular lecture program throughout the year, and then we do special tours on occasion. We have a publications program that gets a lot of our materials out um, into the community, so I'll mention that, uh, and also do an annual Preservationist of the Year award uh, that we've been doing now for over a decade. And then I'll end talking a little bit about three projects uh, that get into our work in documenting and researching our threatened and vanished history in our area. So collections, uh, we have a host of very small to very large objects uh, and have actually been acquiring uh, more on a, on a really regular basis. Uh, what you see here is the, the town's first fire engine, the Stewartstown Fire Company's hand-pulled and hand-pumped uh, fire engine, which is, which is a favorite of visitors to the museum. Uh, recently, we added on the left, we added this wonderful tall case clock, which was manufactured in York, uh, probably 1810 to 1820, and it was uh, owned by a family at Cross Mill in East Hopewell Township. On the right, of course, uh, this is an object that many of you will remember a, a grandparent, a grandmother uh, using uh, on wash day in our area. We have children's toys, things like dolls, doll beds, uh, and many other types of, of both locally produced and nationally produced toys in our collection. And then we have a whole host of agricultural implements and machinery uh, that really speaks to our area's rich agricultural history. What you see here is a, uh, a two-ear corn sheller uh, that was driven by a belt, probably originally off a steam tractor, later uh, certainly could have been driven off a, a gasoline uh, tractor. The other type of collection that we have are documents, and this includes everything from family papers to diaries uh, to a huge number of photographs of, of our community. Uh, newspapers, the Stewartstown News, uh, we have a uh, microfilm of that. What you see here is a, a, a collection of letters um, that were being sent to uh, Everett Gemmel. Uh, so the Gemmel family in town is a, is a name that, that we know. We have things like this uh, beautiful early deed from 1771. And I think the the plat map on the top is an absolute piece of art. Uh, notice the names, the manifolds, the panes, the columns, the Wallaces, really uh, the, the sort of first families in developing our area. This is a really early land grant uh, with that wonderful compass rose uh, done in pen and ink. This document is one of our special ones. This is the document that certified the creation of the borough of Stewartstown in 1851, actually originally named Mechanicsburg, but then subsequently changed because the U.S. Post Office pointed out that there was already a Mechanicsburg in Pennsylvania. Here's a probate document. So this is a document that was created at the death of William Gemmel, uh, and it was to help distribute his property to his heirs. So we have uh, many local folks, uh, mostly Gemmels, 
uh, signing this. This is from the 1790s as well, so in remarkable uh, condition. And we have everything from those kind of papers to things like commercial documents. On the right, uh, this is a receipt from uh, W.B. Shaw, who was a builder, uh, carpenter here in, in Stewartstown from the 1920s. Uh, he actually built quite a few of the houses along Main Street uh, in Stewartstown. And then, of course, from the Stewartstown Lumber and Manufacturing Company, which is where the society has its current museum. And, of course, a place that provided the materials for builders like Shaw and others. We have one major special collection within uh, the society, and that's the collection of the Stewartstown Railroad. Uh, the Stewartstown Railroad was a short line farmer's railroad uh, that was opened in about 1884 and ran into the 1960s to help farmers uh, get their uh, product to market, uh, connected in with the Northern Central Railway. And we have everything from objects. Uh, here's a, uh, an image of engine number two uh, on the Stewartstown Railroad. And we have, we actually, we don't have the engine, but we have the headlight for the engine that you can see if you come into the museum, which was uh, essentially an oil lamp uh, that provided uh, the light for the train. And we have objects like uh, in this display, this is one of our permanent displays that I mentioned, uh, we have like this, this object, like this wonderful ticket uh, machine on the left that would have been in, this, in the train station in Stewartstown. And each of those little tabs are tickets uh, for a distance along the rail line uh, between here and New Freedom, or eventually between here and Fawn Grove. The most, perhaps the most important part of the collection though, is the archive. That's the paper records related to the railroad. And they date from the very beginning of the railroad uh, through its entire existence. Uh, one of the archivists at the Pennsylvania Railroad Museum actually uh, has said that he thinks this is perhaps one of the most important and most complete collections of a short line railroad in the country. Uh, so it's uh, an incredibly important um, uh, piece of history uh, of our area. We have things like these wonderful journals, uh, hay records, uh, records of each train car that came and left uh, the railroad, just, just an incredible wealth of material. This is actually the experimental survey map from before the railroad was actually built. So this is when surveyors were out trying to figure out a route for the railroad. And what's wonderful about it, in addition to giving us great information on the, on the rail line itself, is that it shows both property owners uh, along the rail. Uh, so it gives us some really good information there. And it shows uh, places like the sawmill that you see, uh, bone mill, and then on this next uh, enlargement, uh, a, a number of buildings that were related to a shingle mill. So a lot of really important locational data in, in a record like this, um, that's in addition to having um, the documentation on the rail line itself. I mentioned collections. So again, we have a small library of local history books that you're welcome to come in and use. And then we have a pretty extensive collection of family genealogies that you see on the left. And again, those are open uh, for reach researchers to come in and use um, when we're open on Sunday from two to four. Programs include exhibits, lectures, tours, and the like. In terms of exhibits, as I mentioned, we have both permanent and special exhibits. The railroad is an example of a more permanent exhibit. This is a, a wonderful special exhibit that we had on wedding dresses from our local area, from, from women in the local area. Uh, the dress that you see sort of to the left, that's kind of the brown taupe color, that was actually the, the dress of Jane Heisen, who's the oldest daughter of, of John and Margaret Heisen. She was married in 1876 to uh, and uh, became 
Jane Hyson Anderson, uh, and this is the dress she wore in that centennial year of the country. Recent acquisition uh, donated by Ron Hirschner to the society. Jane's sister, Alice, has also been a subject of a special exhibit that was curated by board member Suzanne Leinbaugh. Uh, and it is focused on this, this quite amazing woman, uh, Alice Heisen, who was a younger daughter, or younger daughter of, of, of John and Margaret. And she uh, was a single woman uh, who throughout her life lived in Stewartstown in the summer, and then in the fall would travel to Rancho Stutawas, New Mexico, where she taught in a mission school run by the Presbyterian Church. And uh, she did that for, for really her whole life, uh, and uh, really an ex extraordinary story of, of an independent and self-determined woman uh, that is, uh, is rather unusual in, in this area, and so an important story to be told. And then we have uh, smaller special exhibits. This is the uh, What Remains of the Ramsey Theater. These are bits and pieces that we were able to salvage, uh, part of the, the stage draperies, uh, some of the lighting sconces, the tin ceiling up in the upper left uh, that uh, survived uh, after that we were able to salvage uh, before the theater was demolished. Again, programs, we do regular lectures, both members of the society and members uh, of other societies and organizations who come in to do special uh, programs, mainly focused on local topics. The three that I show here are all ones that I'm going to talk about a little bit later when I talk about documenting sites that were uh, soon to be demolished. So the James Patterson farm uh, we documented turned into a lecture, John Heisen House, and then the Ramsey Theater. In terms of other types of programs, we've done some special tours. So we did a, a tour of one-room schoolhouses in the area where the 85 participants in the tour were able to look at seven different one-room schoolhouses. And they were able to get inside three, the Trout School in the upper right, the Zion School in the lower right, and then uh, the Heisen School, which I'll talk a little bit more about uh, in a minute. We also do special programming uh, on occasion. This is the Give Local York Block Party, uh, where we set up a booth for this day of giving, uh, raising money for local organizations, and uh, we're able to connect with some some slightly younger constituents uh, in a in a cookie decorating uh, project, which was very successful. We, we do a annual house tour uh, with the Mason-Dixon Public Library uh, and the Society. This year, this is the John Heisen, or the John Fischel House, and we decorated the Fischel House, which was empty at the time, uh, to look like a Victorian era uh, Christmas, and had a very successful uh, day uh, with uh, 250 plus visitors. The Society has a very robust publication series. Uh, the yesteryears in York County were now up to book four, which put together uh, a tremendous number of photographs and information on the history of the area, generally uh, organized within, within thematic types of, of um, areas. The Society also publishes uh, a newsletter for members. Uh, we do that three times a year to give uh, people notice of upcoming events, gifts to the Society, and the like. And finally, in this area, uh, awards. We do an annual Preservationist of the Year Award, and we've actually done that now for over a decade. Uh, the very first uh, recipient is in the, in the bottom right, uh, Catherine Jordan, and she's actually here being interviewed by Jim McClure of the, the newspaper, who then subsequently became one of our preservationists of the year for his amazing work in 
getting the story of York County history out into the media. On the left, this is the Sansonettis, and they're representing the Ma and Pa Railroad Preservation Society, which received the award. And finally, in the upper right, uh, this is the Phillips family, and the Phillips own the second Heisen School, uh, Heisen Schoolhouse, and have done an amazing job as stewards of that important historic property. And I'll talk about that a little bit more next, because next I'll talk about a couple of recent or current projects. Uh, our one of our recent projects was doing a National Register of Historic Places nomination for the Heisen Schools. The original one, which you see in the upper right, that's the uh, Stone School that was built in 1857. And then on the bottom right, uh, you're seeing the second Heisen School built 1892. The top school, the older school, uh, is currently owned by Myrna Heisen Ross, who you see in the center picture here, uh, 99 years young. And uh, Ms. Ross paid to have the, uh, the first Heisen School restored and um, has worked closely with us in the society to open this for uh, special programming um, throughout the year. Our most current project, and one that's still ongoing, is redoing the walking tour of downtown Stewartstown. And what you see on the right is a map of, of kind of our draft idea of what the center of town walking tour will look like. We'll also do one on the upper end of town and the lower part of town when we get this finished. Um, and this walking tour really will take you by and provide information on so many wonderful structures in town. In the upper left, and we're gonna go clockwise, is the Margaret Jones House. Uh, it's up near the post office. And Margaret Jones was the pianist who accompanied the silent movies at the Ramsey Theater. The next on the right uh, at the top is the, the New Leader Hotel, which was owned by George Bruninger. And George Bruninger's daughter, uh, Bessie Bruninger actually married Charles Ramsey, who built the Ramsey Theater. Moving down, uh, we have the Fulton House, which was an early hotel uh, lodging, later became the Trout Hotel, right on the corner in the square. Below that, the Reverend Cowhick House. This was uh, built uh, for Reverend Cowhick, who was a minister at the Presbyterian Church in 1860 by local carpenter, Archibald Heisen. If we keep going over to the left side, that's the John Fischel House again that we talked about. Uh, the next up is the James Fulton Store, now the offices of Stewartstown Borough, and then finally back up to the Margaret Jones House. So we will be able to take you through. Hopefully we will be doing some uh, organized walking tours. There'll be guided tours, but we'll also have a booklet available for folks who would just like to do the tours on their own. And finally, I wanna to touch on our work documenting and researching the threatened and vanishing history of our area. Specifically, I'm gonna talk about the Patterson Farm, the Heisen Farm, and then finally the Ramsey Theater. And of course, I can't move on without this wonderful quote from Joni Mitchell's 1970 song, Big Yellow Taxi, don't it always seem to go that you don't know what you've got till it's gone? Well, one of the first gone sites that we're gonna look at is uh, what was originally the James Patterson farm, later the McElwain family farm. And if you look in the upper left, that group of buildings up there, that's actually the corner of the Plank Road and Route 24. Uh, just to give you a little context. And of course, the reason this farm is no longer extant is the construction of the new subdivision known as Mayberry that we see here uh, under construction uh, probably a few months ago based on the number of houses that we see. So the property was originally uh, purchased and developed by James Patterson, who was a local farmer and distiller, probably in about 1783 plus or minus. Uh, his son, Edie Patterson, then took over the farm and owned it 
uh, throughout a good part of the 19th century. He was also a farmer, distiller, and a tavern keeper. He built the tavern that's at the corner uh, of the Plank Road and 24, that's now apartments right next to the, um, the laundromat and the car wash. And then his son, James Patterson, then owned the farm. Uh, he was a local nurseryman uh, as well as uh, area farmer. So the Patterson family owned it for 100 years. It then went to the Scots. Uh, this is Reverend Scott, who was a pastor at the Presbyterian Church, left the ministry and became a farmer uh, and owned and farmed the property for 40 years before selling it uh, to the McElwain family in 1923. And they literally have then owned it right up until the point of the construction of Mayberry. So really just three families over a course of, of 200 plus years. Uh, here's the farm again, showing the house and some of the agricultural, uh, quite a big group of agricultural outbuildings, all of which were really pretty much still extant um, at the time it was demolished. And when we do these documentation projects, we do two things primarily. One is uh, make measured drawings, and this is the, the finished plan of the first floor of the Patterson House. We do one for each floor. And in the process, uh, of making these drawings and doing the measuring, we learn a tremendous amount about the construction and history of the house. Um, we also do at the same time, a tremendous number of photographs to record the, the house uh, or the building for posterity. And you'll see here that there were really two parts to this house. What we learned was the original part was log built in the 1780s. And then in the mid 19th century, when stoves became popular. Uh, there was a stone L added to the back of the house and the interior of log house was kind of updated and given a, uh, a bit of a makeover at that point. So here it is before the uh, deconstruction started. On the right and in the back, you'll notice a smokehouse. Uh, that's an 18th century smokehouse that, that gladly was moved and preserved by a member of the McElwain family. And here's the house after it was stripped. Uh, you can see the original uh, late 18th century logs. We were able to learn a lot about different window openings and configuration of the house through the years, the way it changed and the way it worked as a dwelling uh, for the Patterson family and those families that came after them. The next project I wanted to look at was the John and Margaret Heisen House. Uh, and this is on land that's now owned by the Marsteller family. Uh, the house sat right about here. Uh, there's a new house that they built that's off to the left. And I was able again to get in um, a little bit after deconstruction started, but was allowed to move through the house, measure, document, photograph uh, before it was completely uh, completely torn down. Here's the house uh, in the late 19th century, and you see John and Margaret Heisen, and three of their daughters, uh, that would be three of their 14 children that were born and grew up in this house. So the John Heisen family owned it probably from a, about the late 1840s all the way uh, up to 1911, uh, when one of their daughters, another one of their daughters, Bertha Eisen, married B.F. Payne, Manifold, and they then lived in the house all the way up until 1960. So really, a, a, almost 100 years of Eisen, Eisen, Mars, or Eisen Manifolds, and then the Marsteller family bought it in 1960 and have uh, owned it uh, ever since and still uh, own the property today. Here's that family of 14, uh, actually 16 with the parents, uh, 14 children. This was taken in York in 1888. Uh, the, the parents are the, the two in the very center of the, of the photograph that we see here. One of the amazing documents that we have recently discovered in the society is this teacher's attendance record. And of course, it ties this to the Heisen School, the Stone Heisen School, 
actually all of those 14 Heisen children attended school at the Heisen school. And this is one of the teacher's attendance records. And uh, for example, here you see the name Jane A. Heisen, right? Uh, so the eldest daughter of the Heisen family, the owner of that wedding dress from 1876, we saw that begins to tie all these sites together into a real community history. Again, in taking this building apart, learned a lot about the construction, the framing. This building was likely also built by Archibald Heisen, who was John Heisen's brother. Uh, so perhaps not surprising uh, that he was, uh, he was the carpenter of this building. And it started as the lower block, the main block that you see in this drawing, the bottom section. Uh, and then in about 1859, plus or minus, they added this large, what we call L, to the back of the house. And that L added six bedrooms. Why was that important? Because by 1859, the Heisens had seven of their 14 children and another one on the way. So they needed more space. Uh, and we, we see that literally play out in the construction of this uh, addition to the back of the house. And the final property I wanna look at uh, is, is one of these situations where it is a parking lot. And uh, many would argue that they took down Paradise to put up a parking lot. Uh, and that Paradise was the Ramsey Theater built in 1920. Originally a silent movie theater, uh, we see it here. It's, it, it had seating for about 300, had two apartments on the upper floors where the Ramsey family and later Bruningers uh, lived, uh, but it ran all the way up until the 19, uh, well into the 1960s uh, here in town, uh, showing everything from silent movies at the beginning uh, to uh, into the era of talkies and then uh, into uh, full Technicolor uh, as we move into the, the uh, 1950s and Elvis and, and, all, and the like. But the first movie shown was a silent movie, as I mentioned, called The Miracle Man. It was shown on December 23rd, 1920. And Ramsey offered free admission to everybody in town uh, to get them to come in and experience the excitement of the moving pictures. Must have been a special time in the life of the community. Well, we did learn quite a bit about this building again during the, the deconstruction. One of the things we learned was it was a lot, uh, in a lot more sound condition than it looked from the outside. One of the quotes that we had from the newspaper that we could never quite figure out was, the carpenters have the Ramsey apartment and amusement building ready for the placing of the tile with which the building is to be erected. Nobody quite knew what this meant. And they assumed that tile meant applied tile like you'd apply in your bathroom, right, to the wall. But in fact, if we focus in here and look right here within this circle, what, what tiles were, were these blocks, these construction blocks, and they were actually something called structural terracotta tiles. Uh, incredibly strong uh, material that was used for building from about 1900 to the mid 1920s. So of course, right during the period of construction uh, of the Ramsey Theater. Uh, and the, the people tearing it down uh, actually said that it, it took more time to tear it down than was anticipated because it was so solid of a building and one that in retrospect uh, could have easily been, um, been saved and uh, repurposed uh, perhaps as a community uh, asset. And there it is again, shortly before it went down. Again, those windows on the upper floor those were apartments with that wonderful balcony out front. And then the boarded windows that run down along the side, that's all the actual seating part of the theater. And the little bit at the back uh, that steps down is the stage to the theater. Uh, there was also a basement where uh, there was a restaurant and a pool hall 
uh, back a billiards uh, room back in the day as well that that many folks uh, still remember today. So that's just a little bit about the society, what we've accomplished uh, as we've served the community of Stewartstown and beyond uh, for over 40 years. And I thank you for spending a few minutes to learn more about the society. I hope you'll take the chance to come in and visit us. We're open every Sunday from two to four o'clock. Uh, and again, to perhaps join in one of our public lectures, uh, which we uh, uh, which we post uh, on our Facebook site and also in various locations around town. Um, and that we'd encourage you to join, uh, be part of the society, consider uh, being a, a, an active member and helping to support the work uh, that, as you can see here, we've been doing now for 40 years in Stewartstown. So with that, thank you very much.